You are tuned to the Nighttime Podcast, focused on the fringe of Canada. Hello, listeners. For tonight's episode, I'm going to be bringing you a missing persons case that has remained unsolved since 2002. Then 21-year-old Lisa Marie Young spent her last known night enjoying the Nanaimo, BC nightlife with her friends. However, after becoming separated in the early morning hours, she would make contact with them one last time via a message stating that she was being held somewhere against her will. Her story, as you will soon hear, is as heartbreaking as it is frustrating. Unlike any other story I recall covering, this case, to me, seems solvable. Yet, here we are, almost 20 years later, wondering what happened to Lisa. In tonight's episode, we're going to be joined by Laura Palmer, the host of the Island Crime Podcast who investigated Lisa's story in her first season. You may notice I make a little bit of a big deal about our guest Laura's name. I couldn't help but commenting on it as she shares the name Laura Palmer with the main character on my favorite television show, Twin Peaks. So let's get to my discussion with Laura Palmer. Our topic is the disappearance of Lisa Marie Young. I want to start by saying how much I love your name. I'm a huge Twin Peaks fan. Okay. You must get that a lot, right? I do. It's uh, less so now, I would say, but um, 20 years ago, I, you know, I couldn't go anywhere without people thinking that was quite something. That, that was my yeah. name, but I, I had it first. Yeah. Right? Because <laughs> I, I, like when the show came out, I was, I was a kid, so I, w- I wouldn't have known about it. But like, how old were you when Twin Peaks was like actually on the air? So, uh, Laura Palmer, the Twin Peaks Laura Palmer, and I are the same age. That's crazy. <laughs> so, yeah. So it came out and I was in university in Northern Ireland, actually. And all okay. of my friends started uh, sending me notes and saying, oh, this is the creepiest thing. So, <laughs> but, wow. but of course, yeah, I've had to go there, you know, and hang out there and have the coffee and the cherry pie and all that. But yes, <laughs> anyway. <laughs> That's very cool. So not the Twin Peaks Laura Palmer, but the Laura Palmer in Canada, who's uh, producing a very popular podcast. Tell me about her. Who are you? What's your background? So uh, I'm a journalist. I currently live in Port Alberni, which is a small blue collar town on Vancouver Island. Um, I spent almost all of my working life with the CBC, about 25 years or so. And I mostly worked in the Vancouver newsroom. Um, Yeah, so I I produced radio shows for the most part, uh, current affairs shows, local and network shows. And then about two years ago, my husband got a job offer on the island, and it was the kind of offer we couldn't refuse. So I quit my CBC gig and moved here. So you're kind of going the opposite direction because like your podcast is... It's it's you. It's a like a DIY kind of independent podcast. That's like a, it must be weird going from the world of you know national radio kind of stuff to working from your home doing your own thing. Yeah, it is. Uh, you know, before I left the CBC, I had started working in podcasting, and the last podcast I produced, you know, we had a large team, and of course, at the CBC, you would have an IT department, uh, communications department, sound engineers, um, researchers, lots of people uh, involved in the process, and um, this has been uh, me. So it is, it's very, it's very different, but there's, um, there's good and bad from that. You know, uh, I can spend all the time in the world. I don't have de- uh, deadlines, daily deadlines to meet. I don't have bosses to answer to. And, uh, I've learned a lot at the CBC about, you know, standards and skills and all of that, that I can put into practice, but without having the layers of bureaucracy to deal with to get things done. So um, 
in some ways, it's actually easier to do it on your own. Yeah, that must be a lot of freedom. But I guess, um, but but at the same time, it would be nice to have that list of credits at the end of all your, of your episodes of all the people that have done the, you know, the laborious work for you. Uh, shows like yours and mine, they don't really have credits at the end because I, I get it. I do this uh, every bit of my show much like uh, much like you're doing yours but i guess uh, to do like a story like this with with lisa's like it's obviously something close to you so not only do you get to cover something you care about but you get to do it like completely on your own terms so that that must be great but to, to start tell me like before we get into lisa's story how did how did you come to be so interested in her story like how did you learn about this and get involved so Lisa was a friend of a friend. So okay. I had heard about her case a long time ago through a personal connection. And while I was at the CBC, I did what I could over the years to kind of advocate for coverage of her case on the local shows. Um, but it wasn't really until I began speaking with Lisa's closest friends and family that I would say I became like really invested in her story. And uh, really, I think once people start to learn about Lisa's case and hear about what has happened and this incredible um, miscarriage of justice as well, I think it's hard not to get pulled into it. Um, you know, for a few reasons, and I'll and maybe I'll just tell you a little bit about that. Um, yeah. F first of all, Lisa's case should have been solvable nineteen years ago, and Lisa herself is just the most um, well lovable character uh, in terms of a story. She has so much heart and so much grit it's just hard not to really feel for her and connect with her and then you know the commitment of those who love her to this day to keep fighting for her is unbelievable like and you know you um here in my podcast just the lengths to which people have gone through to fight for lisa and are still fighting for her now. So there's just so much about her story um, that just gripped me from the get-go. Mm -hmm. um, be before we get into into her story much, what I'm, another thing I'm curious about, and this will be good to hear you talk on this being coming from CBC and the media. Like I'm on the East Coast of Canada and I don't think I'd heard of Lisa's story until like listeners of my show were writing and emailing me telling me ab about her case and you know recommending coverage and whatnot how is her story viewed for people locally like is is this like a well-known a, a well-known case in, in that area um no so uh Lisa's case was well known in her small community of Nanaimo mm -hmm. and uh and saying that, I still now get people writing to me saying, hey, I'm from Nanaimo and I've never heard of this story. Um, but I would say, you know, to a certain extent, it was well known in her community of Nanaimo. To a lesser extent, uh, the rest of Vancouver Island um, may have heard of her story. There were a couple of local reporters, one in particular, who has been on her case from the beginning. But for whatever reason, um, I would say before my podcast, there really just wasn't much in the way of national or international attention outside of an occasional kind of one-off here or there over the years. And, you know, I don't really know why that is. I think, like, I can't, I can't really think of another story that, in my view, is as compelling as hers is, you know, and, and so I don't really understand why it isn't a better known story. And I hope now that it will continue to get the attention it deserves, because I do believe that is putting pressure on people um, involved in her disappearance and on the police to solve it. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, and that's one thing that really stands out to me is often when you hear the story of of a missing person, there's this kind of vague ending that's you know mysterious and where do they go and who are they with? But with Lisa's story, that really that really isn't the case. It seems like for an investigator, there's a pretty clear line that that you follow. But but we'll we'll get to that when we talk about her um, her last known day. Let let's start with talking a bit about her background. Like you, you said at the beginning, there she's like a, a well liked, lovable person. Tell me a bit about the kind of her family life and how she grew up. Like maybe set the stage for for who Lisa was. Yeah. So, um, well, something I should say at the outset that I didn't uh, say yet is Lisa uh, was indigenous. Um, her mom, Joanne Young, is a member of the Tlaquiat First Nation. And um, that's an important part of this story. And I'll talk more about that as we go forward. But Lisa's mom uh, is a First Nations woman. She is married to a guy named Don Young. He is not First Nations. Uh, the two of them got together when Joanne was quite young and had three children. So Lisa has two brothers, Robbie and Brian. And, you know, according to Dawn, they have a really happy life when the kids are little. You know, life is busy. Anybody listening who has young kids will know this. Uh, it's a busy time. It's a happy time. Joanne is at home with the kids. And really, uh, you know, Dawn has very happy memories of that period. When I, when I first went to meet him, he sat down with me and showed me all these pictures of the family when they're young. And, uh, well, first of all, I will say this, Lisa is like the cutest kid in the world. She is like just a real sweetheart. There's all these pictures of her with like, cats and riding her bike and, you know, with friends and she's, she's adorable. So they have like a happy life. As Lisa gets older, um, she and her mom have some conflict in their relationship. And uh, for a period of time, Lisa ends up in foster care. This is something that in all of the coverage up until my podcast, is not talked about. And um, there's a few reasons for that. One is that uh, Lisa's mom, Joanne, you know, was very hurt by all of that and sad about what had happened with their family breaking down. And while she was alive, the family didn't really want to talk about that. Lisa's mom, Joanne, passed away a few years ago. And uh, when I approached the family and this aspect of Lisa's story came out, they said they were okay with that, you know, that they, they were comfortable with that at this point. And as her foster sister told me, you know, there's all these thoughts about foster care that like you come from a bad family or you're a bad kid, if that's your story. And they really wanted to make clear that, that, that that's not the case, you know, that this was a family that was having a period of crisis and Lisa was in foster care for that reason, but she was beloved by her family um, and, and maintained, even while in foster care, very close relationships with her family, especially her dad, Don, uh, who she was very, very close to. So when she, at the point that she went missing, was, wasn't until her early 20s. Maybe you could tell me a bit about what was going on in her life at this period of time and um, like going into her teenage years and young adulthood. Well, actually, maybe that's not even young adulthood. 21's adulthood. Yeah. But what was happening in her, her life at this point? Well, so Lisa, and this is one of the things that, you know, as as I said at the outset, because I can spend time um, lots of time learning about um, the story, I got to really talk to Lisa's friends and family about who she was in life and, and paint a portrait of this young woman. And so she's, she is at that point in her, in her life, um, just kind of coming into herself, I would say. She is described as someone who, um, you know, for example, loved seeing live music. She was a big fan of the local music scene and had lots of friends who were musicians. 
um, one of her friends, Alison Crow, who is a um, uh, fairly well-known musician now, uh, talked about how Lisa was one of the first people to just come out and support her and come to all her gigs wherever she was playing. She was also really sporty. She loved hockey. She loved the Canucks. She liked basketball. Um, her dad talked about how she was on the short side, but, you know, loved playing basketball and wanted to be on the high school basketball team. And, you know, she kind of was a bit of a contrast in that she was also kind of a girly girl, you know, she was that sporty side, but she loved fashion. She was really into independent small stores. Um, she was into tattoos long before they were fashionable as well. Um, and she wanted to be a sports caster. So she's like a bit of a fitness nut. And uh, one of her friends talked about how she would have loved Fitbit as well. Um, but she, you know, uh, as I said, she grew up in a home where, um, you know, they, they didn't have a ton of, of money. And so she is, uh, as, as a teenager working at McDonald's, she works her way up to being the manager at McDonald's. And when I started poking around on her story, I had countless people um, reach out to me who worked with her at McDonald's and talked about like just how great she was at her job, how she was good at dealing with customers who were like cranky. And she becomes a manager there at quite a young age. Now, just leading up to her disappearance, um, she has quit McDonald's and she is about to start a new job, an office job at a call center. Um, one of the things I learned when I was, uh, you know, talking to lots of people about Lisa is there's this um, thought in some of the news stories after she disappears that she was working for a long time in the bar scene. And in fact, some of the writing around her disappearance was, well, you know, she she worked in the bar scene and she was kind of a tough nut because she she knew that scene and, you know, she could handle herself. But uh, as far as I can tell, she only worked in the bar scene for a few weeks. Um, the owner of the bar where she worked said, you know, as as best he could tell, it was just a few weeks, uh, not more. So, yeah, she knew the bar scene, but was she this kind of seasoned bartender? No, she wasn't. Um, and then again, uh, another factor that's probably worth noting in the time leading up to her disappearance, Lisa is also getting set to move. She had been sharing a flat with a friend um, close to where her parents lived, like close enough that she would pop in and out every day. And she is just getting set the next day to move to a new apartment, a move her father was going to help her with. Wow. So definitely the picture that's being painted is her coming into her own. There's kind of a couple forks in the road and she's finding her way, but it seems like she, she's on her way to, you know, finding her place in the world is, is kind of the, the picture that's that I'm that I'm picking up here as well. as I, I'm also seeing myself in this story because I worked at McDonald's when I was around her age and I left to move to a different spot and work at a call center in Halifax. That's how I actually I live in Halifax now and that's in my hometown in Cape Breton. It's like to get, unemployment's so high to get a job at McDonald's was a really good job for like a 17, 18 year old. So I, I guess I can kind of see that the type of person she was and the path that she was on. But we're at the part of the story now where things really change, which is June, I think it's 29th is the day in 2002, is when all of this happens that leads to her disappearance. My understanding is that night, it seemed to be an unusual night for her, where she was, I believe it was a midweek that she was going out to celebrate a friend's birthday at, at a bar. Am, am I... Is that correct? Uh, so it's actually the Canada Day long weekend. Oh, it is. Okay. It is. Yeah. But you're mm -hmm. right about uh, she is going out to celebrate her friend's birthday. So mm -hmm. uh, 
Her dad says uh, that night starts out just in the most normal way imaginable. She is hanging out with her dad, watching TV. Uh, she's 21 now, so they're sharing a beer. You know, they're they're close, right? Like they're really they're they're buddies at this point. And he doesn't want her to go out. He says, you know, it's getting late. You're moving the next day. It's, you know, a move that they've been working on together. He's he's going to be helping her with. But it is her friend Dallas Hully's birthday. And as her foster sister told me, Lisa is like big on birthdays. She makes them special. She always wants to make a big deal out of it. And so even though, you know, her family is urging her not to go out, she decides she's going to go out because it's Dallas's birthday and she wants to celebrate with him. So she goes out quite late, actually, um, you know, well after 10 o'clock, uh, maybe close to 11. I've heard a few different um, versions of that, but it is getting to be a little bit late when she goes out. And back then, Nanaimo, um, Lisa's hometown, is known for having a pretty hopping little club scene. There's um, a series of, of clubs and bars that are all close together on a narrow little street called Skinner Street. And they're going out there to celebrate uh, Dallas's birthday. So Lisa is out at a place called the Jungle Cabaret. Now, the jungle is, uh, it's still there, actually, um, but it's now called Evolve. And I'm told she's there. She's having a good time. She's in good spirits, as is her buddy, Dallas. Uh, I'm actually told Dallas, uh, you know, as many young people might be on their birthday, he is, uh, he's feeling no pain, shall we say, uh, <laughs> by the time, <laughs> yeah, by the time the bar closes. Um what is really normal at that point in time and to this day is for people to kind of spill out onto the street and have a bit of a party on the street as well. So this is the Canada day long weekend. It's summer, it's warm, people are hanging out on the street. That's all normal. Uh, and it's while they're kind of out there in the parking lot area that they meet up with a young guy named Chris Adair. Now, Chris is um, not known to Lisa at the time. And although there is some suggestion, and there has been some suggestion to me, that he was not a stranger to Dallas Hully. Chris uh, is driving his grandmother's red jag. Burgundy, maroon, I've heard it described a few different ways. It's an older model, red jag. This is a big deal in a small town like Nanaimo, right? Guy comes up, he's good looking, he's kind of a preppy looking guy, charming, and he starts chatting up their group. He offers to take them uh, to a house party. Because, you know, I don't know if you can remember when you're young, two o'clock in the morning feels like the night should keep going, right? Should go on yeah. forever, eh? How dare the bar close so early? We're just getting started. Yeah, no, I've been there before, yeah. years ago. Yeah, so fine. You know, this guy seems like a, a good guy. He's, he's friendly and he offers to give them a drive. And Lisa is with a couple of her friends. And so off they go to a house party. In fact, they go to two house parties. Uh, but it's at the second house party, and this is where, um, you know, information begins to get a little uh, thin, I would say. Um, we know that she goes to this second house party. The story goes that Chris Adair overhears her asking uh, if there's any food around because she's hungry. Lisa is a vegetarian, and apparently the only food at this place is not food that she can eat. Um, he overhears her and offers to take her somewhere to get something to eat. Um, you know, this part of the story for me has never been fully um, verified to my satisfaction, I would say. I 
I don't know if that's why Lisa goes with him, but in any event, she does leave with him. That much has been confirmed. The two of them alone leave him and his grandmother's red jaguar with with her, who who he presumably just met that night. Correct. And and you say, and this is the so the bar is closed. They went to one party now to a second party with him. Yep. What time? What time is it that this is happening? Like this must be the early morning hours. That Correct. This is happening. Yeah. So this is now getting into the early morning hours, maybe around three thirty or so, when okay. Lisa leaves with Chris Adair. Okay. Um, the next time anyone hears from Lisa is when uh, Dallas Holly says he gets uh, a communication from Lisa saying, um, hey, this guy has not taken me for something to eat. I don't know what's going on. This guy won't bring me back to the party. We're sitting in a driveway on Bowen Road. And they won't let me leave. Like, come and get me. Now, unfortunately, Dallas is, um, well, he's drunk, right? He's been drinking all night. And it does not occur to him that this is a crisis, you know? He just says, like, get out of the car, you know? And you have to also remember that Lisa... Lisa is not a shrinking violet, right? Even Lisa's dad says, like, she'd just be getting pissed off at that point. He doesn't think she's fearful at this point. She's getting mad, you know? And so Dallas, obviously, and I, I'm told he lived with deep regret over this. He, he doesn't sound the alarm bells at this point. Um, and unfortunately, you know, Lisa... Lisa just called the wrong guy, right? You know, she thought this was her friend. She was going to get help and she didn't. And so, sorry, go ahead. No, you you had said it was, he got a communication from her. So that was a phone call. She called him while this was happening. I'm, I'm assuming Dallas is probably still at the party and just not taking it as seriously as he would have and maybe in a different context. Correct. And I believe there are follow-up texts as well. Some of the stories I read said she called other friends, but I have never had that confirmed to me by any of her other friends. Now, saying that, there are people close to Lisa, friends of Lisa, friends who were out that night who have never talked to me and have never talked to anyone else. So I think it, you know, it's entirely possible that she did call somebody else. Mm-hmm. Um, one of the texts, I think perhaps the final text she sent to to her friend was was basically saying like they're they're not going to let her go. Do you, do you have any details of any of these texts that, that were sent after that phone call? Like any idea of what what she was saying in them? Well, that last text is to Dallas. Come get yes, me. Okay. They won't let me leave. And they, right? which may they. imply there's more than Adair involved. Yes. Now, I should say, uh, Christopher Adair has never been charged with anything connected to Lisa's case. I have had it confirmed to me that he is the driver of the Red Jag. That is clear. That is not in dispute. But he has not been charged with anything connected with her case. And uh, according to Lisa's mom, Joanne, it is his story that Lisa got out of the car and took off and he doesn't know what happened to her. Um, Wow. Yeah. So, and this is kind of a strange part of the story as well. And maybe I'll just um, jump ahead here a little bit. Lisa's mom, Joanne, in the weeks after Lisa disappeared, is called to the police station one night where the police have Chris Adair at the lockup. And according to her, and this is a story that, you know, she told her husband, Don, she told her sister, she told a number of people. I couldn't talk to Joanne because she has passed away by the time I started my investigation. 
But this is a story I've had confirmed by many people, including the RCMP. So I, I believe this story to be true. She is called to a lockup where Christopher Adair is being questioned by the police. And she is asked to bring with her, you know, a picture of Lisa, any of Lisa's, you know, personal effects. She believes in an effort to get Christopher to say what he knows. They actually ask her to hug him, which, you know, honestly, every time I hear that, I, uh, I feel sick to my stomach because I can't imagine being a mom and being asked to hug this guy. But nevertheless, she is asked to do that. And she does. And she says it is the hardest thing she has ever done in her life. Still, this guy sticks to his story. He won't say anything. He says to her, I don't mean to disrespect you or your family, but I can't say anything else. That's all I can say. And so, you know, really, that is it from him. I, I, I tried everything I could think of to talk to him um, when I was putting together this podcast. I did manage to speak with uh, people close to him. No one would go on the record. Uh, and as you can imagine, this, um, what happened created a deep rift in that family as well between the people who believe him and think, you know, for better or worse, he had nothing to do with what happened to Lisa after he last saw her that last last time. Um, and those who think he may have had something to do with her disappearance. So I, you know, obviously I'm being careful here because again, no one has been charged and he is the only person whose name is connected with her disappearance uh, publicly. There are others whose name is, whose names are well known to police, well known to those close with the story, other names, but his is the only name that's actually out there. Um, he, now, Chris Adair does collect a bit of a criminal record around the time that Lisa disappears. He has convictions for assault, uh, for fraud, uh, for a couple of other crimes, assaulting a police uh, officer. You know, this is a guy who's who's in some trouble around that time, despite the fact that he's from uh, a very privileged family. Hmm. So, uh, you know, and the, and the fact that he's from a, a privileged family becomes a part of this story because there is also, um, well, an allegation that it is that privilege that prevents a robust investigation at the outset. Yeah, and and that's the part that really surprised me. When, when like when you tell the story now, this seems like the type of story that two weeks later arrests are made, just because there's a clear kind of line that you would think we have a look like who she was with, a location where she maybe she was at a vehicle that she, we know she was in. And the, and just to be clear, there was no sign of her after these text messages. It's not like she there was any trail beyond that. Nothing. Is there any, what about her phone? Like uh, nowadays all often we hear about when a phone was turned off or disconnected or whatever. Do we know any of the details of what happened with her phone after these texts? No. no. <laughs> so okay. the police I did ask that question to the RCMP. I should say it took about eight months of requests for the RCMP to speak with me about Lisa's case, despite the fact that it's you know now 19 years old. Um, but but when I asked them about the cell phone, they said you know that is the kind of evidence they would not talk to me about. It is part of their case, um, but the details of that they would not tell me. So I do believe that you know they have information and evidence related to her cell phone, 
but I don't know what it is. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That, that makes sense. I, I can understand why they would keep a lot of information to themselves, but a lot is public. So there's, there's no trace of her after these phone calls. Do we know much about the investigation? Um, it just, it seems the investigatory trail, it's pretty clear for me as a layman where I, who I'd want to talk to, where it would go. Do we have any idea of what path they took, what suspects were considered? So, so, much, okay. So much about the investigation is off um from the start so lisa when lisa doesn't show up that morning uh her parents know right away that something is wrong because she is supposed to be moving she's supposed to be starting that new job right so uh it's like around 10 or 11 in the morning when they start to worry and they start calling her friends and trying to figure out what's going on right and so it's like that morning that they first called the RCMP. And of course, uh, and maybe this is not going to come as a surprise, uh, at that point, the RCMP do not take this seriously. The first officer uh, who comes out to the house kind of, you know, says, look, she's young, she's probably out partying, she's probably on a bit of a bender, she's sleeping it off somewhere. He's a... Uh, this is now Sunday. He says, call me back on Friday if she still hasn't appeared, right? And so her, her parents are not going to put up with that. They already think something is wrong. And so they keep at it, right? They keep calling the RCMP. They keep saying, no, 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 this is not right. And so while they're... Um, kind of getting put off by the police officially, they begin their own search. They're out driving. They're out looking with Lisa's friends. Lisa's First Nation mounts a number of searches early on. So like they're all getting out there doing the work that the RCMP really should have been doing from the outset. Um, if you read the old newspaper accounts, you have the RCMP. Well, first of all, it doesn't show up in the newspapers um, for, I think it's at least five or six days. When it does, you have the RCMP saying there is no reason to suspect foul play. Uh, so it takes a while, right? And, and, you know, one of the things that kind of, I guess, just bugged me when I started looking at this was watching the Crime Stoppers video. Uh, which is made in, um, I think, 2008. A, a Crime Stoppers video, I will say, that Lisa's mom had to fight to get made. They were originally told, like, um, there's already enough at focus on your daughter's case. This isn't something we need to do. But she fought and got it made. And then in the Crime Stoppers video, the police say, you know, that it's days before anybody alerts the police that she's gone missing, which is not true. And in fact, in my podcast, I asked the RCMP about that and they correct it on the record, which I was really happy that they did because it was always one of those things that kind of made it look like, oh, you know, it was, it was because her family didn't take the steps they needed to take right away that it was off to a slow start. And that's just not, that's just not true, right? Um, and as for why it took so long for uh, Christopher Adair to be identified and brought in for questioning, I mean, that is just a puzzle to me. This, this car, you know, everybody would have known who, everybody knew who owned that car, right? It, was, it would not be a great big secret in this small community. Um, that, that was strange to me. I have had um, people close to Lisa's family say that it was actually Lisa's mother who first identified Christopher Adair, that she went out and spoke to prostitutes about this car. And it was her who figured out who was driving the car. So, you know, the police um, now say that 
isn't it great that they were able to identify this car and, and bring in Christopher Adair? But I always kind of feel like, gee, I don't know. Sounds like it should have happened earlier and that um, in all likelihood, it was Lisa's mom who identified the car. How long was it from when she disappeared to when he was questioned? Do you have any any sense of the, the time that passed? They would not confirm the exact date to me, but according to her family, it was about three weeks. And Shocking. in yeah, and in that three weeks, um, I'm told that the car had already been well cleaned, mm-hmm. uh, steam cleaned. And so, you know, the police would not tell me what, if any evidence they were ever able to gather there. Um, But you can imagine it would have been better had they have got the car at the time. But, you know, really, Christopher Adair did not, he did not deny that Lisa was in the car. So even if they did find evidence she was in the car, you know, that's consistent with his story anyway. So, yeah. Wow. It's... um. It's just it's striking how both the the flubs, I guess, as I'll put it, that the police seem to have make have made like it seems like even if it took three or four or five days for them to take it seriously, this seems like the kind of thing where they re- like this should have all come together right away rather than this, you know, three weeks later um, trying to backtrack using a, a steam cleaned car convenient, conveniently enough. And, and it, this also has all the cliches associated with a missing persons case that wasn't handled well, be it not taking it seriously at the time and wanting there to be a bit of a delay before the parents or family call back, the family mounting their own investigation and gathering details that then turned the police on and then the police seem to be taking care of taking some credit for maybe what the parents and the family had found out. It's uh, this is that's disturbing. And I see now why, like Lisa's case, she's fortunate where there's a large community of people online rallying for her, just as as you've explained at the beginning. And I, and I see now why people feel like such a strong injustice has happened and why they're so um so dedicated to you know to making something happen like i know you frequent the communities a lot online that talk about lisa's case overall like what would you say in general is like the sense uh, what is this what is the kind of the prevailing theories that people have on what happened to her or are there even any um so there's there is a range of thoughts on that um Lisa's father, here's what Lisa's father, Don Young, thinks. He thinks that uh, Lisa was at this party, uh, this last gathering, and that the people there gave her something to, as he put it, get her partying. Um, A date rape drug, I think. And he thinks that she overdosed and they panicked and disposed of her body. Hmm. In some, she has ne- she has never been found. No, no, there, hmm. no. And I guess that's the other strange part of this story, and part of the reason I I, uh, I said at the outset that I think this is just one of the strangest and most interesting cases. There has always been also allegations that her body has been moved. Um, that is a a story that is told consistently right from the beginning. Uh, And I've had that told to me by a number of people, including Lisa's father. Um, He gets a call just shortly after Lisa disappears from a frantic woman saying, Lisa, is her body is being moved. You got to come out here right now to a specific place. He calls the police and the police say oh no that's that's just that's just crazy talk we know who that is and totally discounted um but that is one of that is part of lisa's story uh that that there has been uh that her body has been moved now whether so i said don's don's theory about what happened to lisa there are other um more sinister versions of what happened to Lisa that night. Um, A story that is 
often told, and I have had it told to me by a number of people uh, in the criminal world at the time who say they know this to be true, is that they were making um, uh, pornography that night and that Lisa was brought there for that intention, that they were making phony snuff films and that she died accidentally as part of that process and that that is why um, her body was disposed of and that they that there was the cover-up at the time so you know I always felt like oh geez like that is the worst possible story and I really don't want that to be true but I must say there are many people close to the story who do believe that there is truth in that. Um, so I, I don't know. I mean, those, those, those are two stories that are told uh, most often connected with Lisa's case. We don't know for sure which yeah. version is true. And then I think to the texts and the phone calls where at least she had enough freedom at this point to use her phone to reach out for help. So I'm just trying to fit that into the, to the two kind of prevailing theories. And I guess it could imply it could match with both where if she's saying things like they won't let me leave, there's mm -hmm. a reason that they are keeping her there. And yeah, that's um, the only thing is I think if, if like with that was the date rape drug and she was drugged, maybe that would have come across on the phone call. But then again, we don't really necessarily know what state cognitively Dallas was in and if he would have been able to read that. Um, but yeah, that's uh, that's really dark. That and with a case like this that has gone on for so long, I get how these theories can come can kind of find themselves in the framework of the telling of the story. So it it makes it almost well, it makes it a lot harder now looking back to try to figure out what has happened because people's memories and opinions are painted by these stories that are, you know, told and retold. It's kind of hard to separate facts from fiction and you know trace the origin of every different little detail within this. That must have been really hard for you when you were doing your series is figuring out, you know, what is from the police, what is just rumors being uh, recounted to you? Yes, really hard. Um, I will say, though, uh, you know, a number of people who came forward to me after the podcast started airing, you know, are close to this case and to some of the people involved. I had a woman come to me who was working at the jungle that night. Uh, the, the people working at the jungle that night were not interviewed, including this woman who you know, saw Dallas, saw Lisa, saw Christopher Adair, never interviewed. Um, I had two former drug dealers, uh, well known to the police, like really successful drug dealers in Nanaimo at the time, close to some of the people involved, come forward to me as well. Uh, they have now been interviewed by the police subsequently, but weren't back then. Um, and interestingly enough, they both believe the story about the films being made. And, and I'll say this, and this is going to sound probably incredible to people listening, but just before, um, well, it was just before New Year's this year, I had contact from one of the guys who I'd interviewed uh, earlier in the summer about Lisa's case. And he says, well, he was just going through some stuff and he's found this tape and it has a hair sample attached to it. And he, gee, he's wondering if maybe it might be that tape of Lisa. And like, you know, <laughs> anyway, this is incredible, right? You know, this possibility that this guy might have stumbled across this tape. So he tells me he's like walking around downtown Nanaimo now with this tape and he's going to take it to the police. So um, the police tell me that uh, they are going to be doing DNA testing on it. They have not told me what, if anything, is on that tape. And it was um, some old kind of technology, like a camcorder or something. So 
The guy couldn't look at it himself. His memory of it was that it was a poorly made porn tape, but you know, he couldn't he couldn't say what was going to be on it. But all that to say, like this tape, the idea that there is a tape out there um, just keeps keeps coming back. It keeps surfacing. And the reporter I interviewed in the podcast, Kendall Hansen, who uh, was one of the first reporters on this story and reports on Lisa's story to this day, he believes it. Like he, you know, he he thinks there is a tape out there. The possibility is, is horrifying, but it's like if that was ever uncovered, of course, we would have our answer of what happened to her. What aside from this tape surfacing and seeing, you know, who's in it and what happened to her, what do you think? What What is it going to take to solve this case, given the amount of time that's passed? Like, I feel you, you hear the, the saying all the time, someone knows something. I feel like you, this case, maybe more than any other, could have that label applied to it. It seems like there's a group of people who know what happened and they're just keeping it a secret. What's going to, if this gets, if the story breaks and we find out what happens, what's it going to take for, you know, for that day to come? So you're right. There are a group of people. Um, Mm -hmm. The police know who this group of people are. They know them by name, who they are. Um, One of these people at some point is going to break. And whoever is the first to the police to tell their story is probably going to get a deal. And so my hope is that all this heat, all this pressure is going to make somebody crack and come forward. I will say um, the police have done two searches, new searches, uh, just within the past couple of months. Brand new searches with a cadaver dog, with like large teams in there looking at two specific sites. So, I mean, barring someone actually coming forward, maybe, maybe they'll find Lisa and maybe that will be what it takes for them to be able to lay some charges and finally have justice for this family. Do you think it's going to happen? Like, is your sense that you're going to do a follow up episode in the next you know, five years where, where this is solved? Do you feel like it'll happen? You know, when I first started looking into this story, I um, I wasn't optimistic. You know, I just felt like so much time had passed. And if it wasn't going to be solved, uh, and, and when I say solved, I mean, charges laid, uh, it's solved, like, I, not solved, but, you know, there's enough information to connect who was actually involved at the time. Um, but I do feel now, especially given those recent searches, that they are getting close. And I, you know, I talk to the lead investigator every once in a while now, and my sense is he is far more optimistic now than he was um, when I first had the ability to talk to him uh, a year or so ago. Great. And and I think a lot of that new attention and kind of a movement in this case is the result of, of your work. Like you're, you mentioned this at the beginning is there, there hasn't been a lot done about Lisa's story. And what is done is those typical, like, you know, on the anniversary, there's four paragraphs in the local newspaper or something like re- rehashing kind of the basics of the case. You did like a full deep dive, thorough investigation. So like people who are listening and hear the story and that are blown away. Like we we are discussing the very tip of the iceberg. You have like, how many hours is your season about about Lisa? Oh, good Lord. It's long. (laughs) Uh, I, I have 10 episodes. Some of them are an hour ish long. Like it's, it's, it's pretty in, in depth. And you know, um, I could probably do another 10 episodes. You know what I mean? Like, Every yeah. time I turn over a rock, there's more information, more people. Like after I released that last episode um, about uh, the guy who had taken me to the place where he believes Lisa perished. And, you know, after I released that, I had a whole bunch more people come forward to me who are connected in one way or another. So um, there's a lot. There, there is no shortage of information out there, shall we say. And uh, Lisa... I I should also say this, Lisa Marie Young's family and friends 
who advocate for her primarily through Lisa Marie Young's Facebook group. They are the reason that this story uh, has not died, right? Like that, that Lisa's memory is alive and that the push for justice is, is so dynamic right now. Like they are unbelievable, you know, it, and I would encourage people to join that group. It's a, it is an amazing group. Like they're very active. They're really positive. You know, they're always trying to think of new ways to engage people in Lisa's story and bring forward information. Like right, right now, um, Lisa would have been 40 this year and her birthday is May 5th. And so right now her friends and family have a, um, a fitness challenge because of course, Lisa was such a fitness nut. They've got a 40 day challenge, uh, encouraging people to, you know, document what they're doing to stay fit in Lisa's kind of name, you know? Just in part because there is so much darkness around Lisa and her death, they kind of wanted something that would be more about what she was like in life. And so this fitness challenge is just just an example of the ways this group of people, her friends and family, are committed to keeping Lisa's story and name alive. What is the name of the Facebook group? I'm sure people will want to join. Uh, oh, I, well, I think it's just Lisa Marie Young. Okay. I'll link to it in, in the episode notes anyway. Yes. So people yeah. can find it. So, so for people out there who want to learn more about your show and about Lisa, what are some resources? Where should they go to find you and more about Lisa other than the Facebook group? Of course, Well, the Facebook group is the number one place to go because, uh, they are active like daily Lisa's friend, Cindy Hall, who advocates uh, in the group and her foster sister, Carol Ann, and her auntie, Carol Frank. They are administrators in the group. They're super active and they're really responsive too. Like if people ask questions, as long as they're not questions that are like disturbing or upsetting, you know, to the family, there has been some of that in the group, I will say, but really they try to answer people's questions and provide information. So I'd say that's the best place. If anybody is trying to reach me, if anybody's listening and has information, I am reachable at islandcrime.ca. And where do they find you and your show? I'm sure anywhere my show is. Yep. Island Crime must be. Yeah. Yeah. You can find Island Crime wherever you listen to your podcasts. I want to thank you for joining Laura and I in our discussion surrounding the disappearance of Lisa Marie Young. I'm sure by now you agree, this case seems very solvable. I suppose it's just a matter of someone having the guts to step forward, or someone making a mistake. Whichever it is, I hope it happens soon. And with that, I'll begin wrapping up this episode, but before we part I'm going to give some thanks. I want to thank Laura Palmer for taking the time out of producing Season 2 of Island Crime to talk to me. For people interested in a great investigative podcast, I can't recommend her show enough. At the end of this episode, I'll include a short promo for her new season. It's called Gone Boys, and it covers missing men on Vancouver Island. And anyone out there who wants to follow Lisa's story, I've added a link to the Facebook discussion group that follows her case. The group's very active, very welcoming, and well-moderated. Next, a big shout out to Monty Data for contributing the music for this episode. It's a piece called Noir Tokyo. And lastly, a massive thank you to everyone who listens to Nighttime. Without your interest and your support, Nighttime would be as pointless as it would be impossible. But with that said, keeping the show alive is and has always been an uphill battle. So if you want to help take a bit of weight off the show's back, please consider subscribing to the premium feed. Not only does it make the show possible, it'll give you more of each topic than you're going to find here on the free feed, I'm adding exclusive content weekly. So for about the price of a cup of coffee, please help keep the show alive by subscribing to the premium feed at patreon.com slash nighttime podcast. And with that said, let me thank the newest supporters of the show, Sarah, Chris and Elizabeth, thank you for your generous support. But for anyone else who'd like to help out but 
can't do it financially? You can give me a big hand by simply sharing the episodes on social media and letting your friends know what we're doing here. If you have any story ideas or if you want to get feedback on the show, reach me through nighttimepodcast.com slash contact. I'm also on social media using Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, and I'm live on YouTube most Tuesdays, Thursdays, and Sunday nights at about 9.15 Eastern Time. So until next time, take care of each other, hug your loved ones tight, and let me know if you see anything weird. The Nighttime Podcast is written, hosted, and produced by Jordan Bonaparte. Copyright Jordan Bonaparte.